Peter Bartlett. I'm the Associate Director of the uh, Simons Institute and uh, very happy to introduce Bruno Olshausen, uh, who's uh, a professor at the Helen Wills Neuroscience Institute and School of Optometry here at UC Berkeley and also Director of the uh, Redwood Center for Theoretical Neuroscience. Um, he's an expert in, in visual perception, computational neuroscience, and, and particularly computational vision. Um, very exciting to have him talk here today. He was the main organizer for the Brain and Computation program that we held in spring 2018. Bruno, welcome. Thanks. Uh, well, first of all, uh, congratulations to Shafi and Peter, and also before you, uh, Dick and Alistair for reaching this uh, amazing milestone. And also thanks to Jim Simons for making it all possible. Uh, so as Peter mentioned, uh, Christos Papanimitru and I had uh, the great fortune of uh, being able to organize a program on brain and computation in spring of 2018. And the goal of this program was to bring together uh, people from computer science and also from neuroscience to rekindle the connections between these two fields that were actually present at the very beginnings of both fields. And uh, this is just one of the smoking gun proofs of that. It may be sort of hard to, to reconcile this, that the, the, these two fields had a very common, common origin, computational neuroscience and computer science. And so this paper on the left, whoops, uh, the, <laughs> this paper on the left uh, is uh, the, the 1943 paper by McCulloch and Pitts, which is for many of us in computational neuroscience, sort of the root node uh, of our field. Uh, it laid the foundations for many of the models in, in, that we use today in computational um, neuroscience. And, uh, and, but unbeknownst to many people, uh, this, this, this paper was actually also very inspirational to John von Neumann. Uh, so John von Neumann was, was very much uh, in contact and close contact with McCulloch and Pitts as they were devising these models. Uh, in, 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 in it was very influential on him, to him in designing the, the first computer. And so what's shown here on the left below is these diagrams from McCulloch and Pitts's paper uh, Walter Pitts was very enamored uh, about uh, uh, very enamored of logic. Uh, he had read uh, Russell and Whitehead's uh, book, and so he was he was asking the question: Well, how do how do we do logic? What's the neural underpinnings of this in our brain? And so he reasoned and hypothesized there must be neural circuits that compute logical functions in our brain, and this is his his basically hypothesized some of his hypothesized circuits. And it's hard for us to believe when, when we look at this today, but the, the, these drawings here in his paper were for really the first drawings of logic gates. And if you go and read uh, John von Neumann's repeat, uh, report here on the EDVAC computer, um, then uh, you see that there's basically two, uh, two citations in his report, both are McCulloch and Pitts. And so these, these logic diagrams that you see in his paper, um, this is where he's saying it right here, uh, were basically follow McCulloch and Pitts um, in, in in, in this design strategy of how to sort of how to sort of conceptualize these these logic gates. So it's curious that these two fields uh, were you know they they began with uh, very much uh, very much connected, but they sort of uh, at least most of most of our lifetimes uh, have grown more disparate over time. Uh, but but very recently there has been a rejuvenation uh, of this connection. And, and these connections are growing very rapidly. And so I'd like to share with you some of these, some of these exciting developments today. Uh, and so, so many of these revolve around um, this idea of neuromorphic computing. Uh, neuromorphic computing was initially, and the term was initially coined and, and this, this area basically was invented by Carver Mead uh, in the late 1980s and early 1990s. And uh, so Carver Mead is recognized by many people as one of the pioneers of Silicon Valley. He pioneered the process for, for designing a very large scale integrated circuits, a VLSI process that, that people used in designing computer chips. And uh, in, in the 1980s, he worked together with Max Dilbrook, a biophysicist, to try to understand the bio biophysical properties by which uh, neurons signal. And what occurred to him is that the, 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 uh, that the, a lot of the, the, the physics of transistors, which they use in MOSFET transistors, which gave rise to these exponential current voltage relationships, um, were also at play in, in, in the brain, in, in, in cells. And basically, it was the exact same physical laws that governed these exponential relationships in, in nerve membranes. And this, would get, this is what gives rise to the Nernst potential, which relates the, uh, the uh, gradient and ion concentrations to the membrane voltage. And many of these 
and, and these other uh, exponential current, relationship, current voltage relationships you see in neurons, and that's being shown in here on the left. And so this inspired him to say, well, look, if we can see these parallels, then basically maybe we can build systems, we can build physical systems based around the organizing principles of biology. Okay, so we can try to capture and hypothesize what these organizing principles are and build systems that, that, that capture those principles. And this is a way of testing our understanding, right? And we'll learn by building things and we'll learn things about neuroscience and we'll also have this sort of way of innovating and creating new kinds of circuits that can compute in new ways. So that was the idea and uh, the original inspiration of, of neuromorphic computing. And I think there's uh, um, you know, some parallels to this. And I think maybe what I think I want to sort of distinguish uh, between is you know, this idea of capturing the principles versus biological mimicry, just sort of mimicking what biology does versus trying to understand the underlying principles. And so there's an analogy here to, to, to flight. Um, so around the turn of the century, uh, people, um, people understood the principles of um, lift and how to design a wing and, and how that was you know, captured in birds. Otto Lilienthal was one of the people who was really avidly studying that, the aerodynamic properties of birds and trying to build systems that captured that, that property. He built a glider. So lots of people had built gliders. They could glide you know, for some distance and it was successful at that. Uh, but the problem that people faced in 1900 then was not only how to glide, how to get something in the air, but how to keep it in the air and how to keep it stable during a turn. So what they, the problem they had is that every time they tried to turn, the plane would simply just fall out of the sky. They couldn't keep it stable. Uh, and so the Wright brothers were uh, not only inspired by biology, but they adopted the principles by which biology was working. One thing they noticed is that when birds turn, they twist their wings. And this turned out to be a very important innovation when it would enable them to solve the problem of how to keep an airplane in the air and how to turn it stably as they attach some cables to the wings of their airplane so they could twist and warp the wings so that when they turned uh, that it wouldn't simply fall out of the sky. And basically the ailerons on a, on a modern airplane are what um, serve that function today. Okay, So the idea is that by confronting the same problems that biology and evolution had to solve, they were basically able to learn something, test their understanding, and build something new, which they weren't able to do before. Okay, and so this is really, I think, the approach we want to try to adopt in, um, in both neuroscience and computing, right, today. It's really a joint, a joint endeavor. It's a way of understanding the brain, the things that are uh, mechanisms in the brain, and it's a way of inventing new kinds of computing machinery. So what are these problems? How do we, how do we sort of go beyond just biological mimic, mimicry and try to understand the actual principles at work? And you know, what, what are the problems that biology is actually trying to solve? And so here for this, I'll, I'll turn here to one of the sages of uh, psychology, uh, perceptual psychology, Ken Nakayama. So interestingly, the answer to this question will not come from neuroscience, okay? Uh, it's going to come from people studying behavior, animal behavior and neuro, neuroethology. And so this is you know, one thing that Ken told me a long time ago is that in order to understand intelligence, we need to understand its origins. Okay, so what, what was this nervous system created for? What problem was evolution trying to solve? Well, it wasn't trying to solve chess and go, right? These are things we can do with our brains. We sort of think of these as things that smart people do who are intelligent, right? But that's not the problem evolution was trying to solve. Okay, so we can build systems that play chess and go and we're probably not gonna learn much about how brains work or have to be confronted with the same problems that biology and evolution was trying to um, overcome. Okay, so what are those problems? How, so, so if we think about how systems evolved, well, we have to go back to things like you know, spiders and, and flies and ants and things like that. And uh, one of the things that all of these systems have to do is they have to move about in a complex and rich three-dimensional environment. Uh, and they need to make purposeful actions to, and be able to guide their actions in this environment to know where they are, how to get from point A to B, and you know, where to, how to get back to where they were before, where the food was, and so forth. And so this is, this is just sort of highlighting two particular examples from the animal kingdom. Um, so one is the jumping spider on the left, which has a very complex visual system, has very high resolution vision. It doesn't build a web to extend its sensory space. It, uses, it relies upon the vision to do that, it has eight eyes. To, to survey the world. And one of the things that you know, people have been studying these jumping spiders for a long time, and one of the things they noticed about them is when they have to navigate towards a prey item that's too far for, for them to jump to. So normally they, they capture the prey by jumping at it, but if it's too far away to jump, they have to find a route to, to crawl there, to walk there, right? 
And so this is just showing sort of one example of people think a behavior they've observed in the wild is that when the jumping spider first uh, um, sees a prey item here, let me just try to get my highlighter point. Okay, so when they when the spider first sees something here, it says, "Okay, great, I'd like to get that, but it's too far for me to jump, so I have to crawl down here." And as as it's along the way uh, to that route to to getting that, it does this reorienting turn. It's a very prototypical kind of behavior. It sort of turns as though to check, okay, is it still there? Is that where it still is? And what they've noticed is that the angle that it turns at is exactly the right angle given its new position in the world, okay? And so they this set about and studied this and documented this phenomenon in a number of controlled experiments and showed that it's actually doing, has to be doing some kind of path integration to be able to do this to this correctly. It's not simply sort of keeping track of it in the visual, visual field. It has some kind of a model in its head of where it is in the environment and where that thing is I want to get to in the environment. And also in other experiments, people show that it can, it can ascertain from vision the three-dimensional layout of an environment that helps it uh, sort of plan paths. And the other one example on the right is the desert ant, just showing the, this sort of amazing behavior they exhibit where you know the, the ant starts at the nest and in the lower right-hand corner, takes this kind of meandering path and eventually finds food in the upper left. And once it finds the food, um, then it makes a beeline straight back to the nest. It doesn't just sort of meander around. It knows where it is. And this is the vector I need to go in to get back to the nest. Okay, so it's kind of astounding. And so both of these examples were, were you know, head scratchers for people in neurothology for a long time. You know, it, you know, can it be that these animals are doing trigonometry or something in their head? I mean, how are they doing this? And, uh, and so, you know, recently, um, astoundingly, um, uh, modern uh, neuroscience has sort of given us the ability to look inside the brains of animals and see some of this machinery at work. And so this, this story began with actually in, in rats where in, with the discovery of head direction cells. And these are cells that, that fire in a way that it seems to indicate uh, the, the, the current direction of heading. It's not, it's not with respect to some kind of magnetic orientation. It's just you, the, 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 the animal lays down a reference frame and then sticks with that with this neural population. So each neuron fires according to a different direction that the animal is heading. So the model that people have developed for, the, for, for capturing this phenomenon is something called a continuous attractor neural network. It's very similar to the neural networks that these, these attractor uh, neural network models that were invented by Hopfield in the early 1980s. Except here the idea is instead of storing a particular pattern, what this, what, this, what this population of neurons does is it maintains a bump of activity on the population of neurons. And that represents the heading of the animal. And then when other signals come in, for example, from the vestibular system or the motor system or any number of different modalities indicating that the animal has turned right, then what the system does, it has to shift that bump and, and hold it at a new location. So that the, in the models, these neurons are interconnected by a recurrent neural network, which maintains as a memory that bump of activity. That's the animal's internal representation of where it's headed in the world. Um, and then, and then when, these, when these external cues come in indicating that it's turning, that does a short-term modification in the synapses of this recurrent neural network to allow the bump to shift, and then it holds at its new location. And then it can shift back if other cues tell us turning it back in the other direction. Okay, so these models have been out there for a long time. There's a lot of theory that's been developed about them. It's kind of a non-trivial theory that, you know, to get these, these networks to work, to make them stable. Uh, this is a very interesting set of models and sort of and almost a kind of, you know, uh, an experiment you can only wish for, uh, these, the, uh, these, 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 these ring attractor neurons were discovered in the fly brain. Okay, so this is a, this is a, a, a nucleus of neurons, it's called the central complex within the fly brain. And one particular nucleus, unbelievably within that, um, within that structure is shaped like a donut, it's shaped like a torus. And people knew about the, anatomically about the existence of this torus for a long time, anatomically, and only recently, with, with the work of Selig and Jayaram at, at um, HHMI in uh, Howard Hughes Medical Institute, uh, they were able to record from the neurons in this ring during, uh, while the fly, uh, not flies, but here just sort of crawls on a trackball so they can control, you know, so they can record from neurons in its brain and image that. And, you know, again, this is just kind of jaw dropping. It's, it, these are kind of experiments and technology that um, you know, people like myself, we could only dream of <laughs> that we could do this kind of thing. And now, now you know, in, in the year 2020, 22, um, you know, this is kind of fairly routine. Uh, and so here it is, you know, these, this population of neurons in the fly brain, there's 42 neurons in this ring attractor neural network. And the amazing thing about flies is that you can do all kinds of connectomics on them. You have access to the whole population of neurons that you rec can record from it. So it's now can be very well characterized and they can test these, these continuous attractor neural networks models quantitatively. 
And so there's this very intimate, uh, nice, very intimate connection between sort of a deep theoretical model, a very mathematical kind of computational heavy model on one hand, and these actual neural structures um, that you have uh, that, you, that we see in the brain. Um, that's just, just really unbelievable. So this is, these are really exciting developments. And, and, um, and, and, and if for those of you want to know more, so one of the people here, a new hire here at Berkeley, Yvette Fisher, uh, in MCB, she's going to be giving a talk in the Redwood Center next week, next Wednesday, actually, on the plasticity in, in the system. So she's actually going to be starting to record from these neurons with electrodes, so you could actually measure action potentials and characterize the activity on a much finer time scale. Okay, so the, so these are these are really exciting developments that are sort of bringing around a connection between theory and experimental neuroscience. So I think the theory is going to start driving the experiments. The experiments are going to give new insight to the theorists. Um, in ways that just hasn't happened uh, before. And Ila Fita is gonna talk about some examples of the same idea um, for representing position. So in representing position, it turns out the topology is a torus, unbelievably, and people have been able to recover this sort of toroidal structure of the manifold of population of activity in the rat brain. Okay, so it's very likely this continuous attractor neural networks are, are you know, uh, maybe a thing that you're gonna sort of find in other parts of the brain representing other modalities, maybe color, maybe other kind of continuous quantities that we have to reason about um, in the world. And it's also kind of really, uh, you know, I think astounding to, to contemplate the fact that, you know, if this is true, and it appears to be true, that this, that this sort of holding up so far, that this appears to be a kind of continuous attractor neural network, that evolution invented this model, uh, this idea 500 million years ago, right? So we, we've known about it since 1980 and John Hopfield and other models uh, but, but, you know, evolution knew about this and got it working uh, 500 million years ago. <clears throat> so this is, I mean, it's just, it's really kind of um, astounding, whoops, um, to, to contemplate. Okay, um, so, uh, so, that's, so that's, I think, one, one exciting development and things, things happening. And, and another, I think, question that's going to drive a lot of the, of the work um, ahead is, uh, is, is this question of how to compute at very uh, low energy uh, levels and at small form factor. And this is, this is really something uh, that sort of goes beyond just an implementation issue. It really affects how you think about what is being computed, how you're going to compute it, and the very theory of computation itself. And so uh, some, some really nice work along these lines that has come out. Uh, this, is a, this is a book uh, by, by uh, Sterling and Laughlin that captures a lot of these principles that, that brains use to compute at very small form factors with low, very low amounts of energy. I mean, how do you take something like an attractor neural network and put it inside the head of a fruit fly, <laughs> right? That's like a spe speck of dust, right? So, and keep that thing so it's stable and it operates robustly. Um, and so there's a lot of secrets that biology uses and these, you know, these secrets, a lot of them have been, they're not, <laughs> they're, some of them are still secrets, but a lot of them have been discovered and they're out there in the literature. And this book does a wonderful job bringing those things together in one place. So I highly recommend it to everybody as a place to go for, and not just inspiration, but to understand here's a new kind of electronics. Here's a new kind of computing medium um, that, that potentially we should try to build. Um, and so these are some of the principles they talk about. One is, so one in particular is this idea of making the components irreducibly small. That's so that we can sort of get signals to, to propagate around just locally. We don't have to send them large distances. It makes things faster and it requires less power if we can do that, if we can keep everything together in one space. And one example, one very nice example of that is in the retina where we have all this circuitry, which is trying to capture the information that's captured from cones and send it to the brain through the optic nerve. That's that, you know, that nerve bundle coming out the back. And if you sort of just zoom in on the synapse between the cones and the, and the bipolar cells, which is the first you know, synapse relaying this information within the retina, you see this magnificent world of machinery all happening with there within the cone terminal. And so I'll just maybe try to point to the, some of the structures here. So here is this one of the processes of a horizontal cell, which is conveying the responses of neighboring cones in an inhibitory fashion. So it's attract away the contributions of neighboring to cones to reduce redundancy. And there's also gap junctions between cones to amplify signals in, in, in lower light levels. These, these little dots here are synaptic vesicles, which are fusing with the membrane. There's all these different synapses down here with bipolar cells. And these bipolar cells, basically they position themselves at different locations on the cone terminal um, to, so according to what signal amplitude they want. 
and the speed that they want that signal at. So if you're further away, some of these, some of these synapses are formed further away, then things diffuse more slowly to those. And that's actually exploited productively in the way this thing is organized. So a lot, of ha a lot is happening. I think the main, main message I mean to convey here is a lot of ha is happening here in a very small amount of space. Uh, and, and the cover illustration on this book um, just illustrates the, the dendritic tree of a Purkinje cell. And I'm giving the, the reference here to another source of inspiration here, a recent uh, manuscript by Jan Rabai, our own Jan Rabai here in EECS um, of Brains and Computers. He's talking a lot, a lot, also a lot about these design principles from the perspective of an engineer who has to build circuits and design circuits. And one of the things he points to is the fact that in, in our current circuit technology, uh, most the most fan in we can accomplish, where in other words, the number of signals you could have converging on one device is about four. Okay, about a fan in about four to one is basically where these circuits seem to work the best. Whereas the brain works on with fan ins in the thousands, and the and the Purkinje cell, which imaged here on the cover. Um, has a fan end of 200,000, okay? So how, how is that possible, right? That's an existence proof that it is possible to do this efficiently. Biology probably, probably does it for a reason and we need to understand, understand why. Uh, okay, so then, uh, so, so, so at the same time, people in the, in the electrical engineering community have been trying to, uh, basically spurred by the end of Moore's law, trying to create new computing fabrics that can do these kinds of things, that they can compute at lower, lower power, and, and smaller scales. One of the, an example of these are so-called memristor crossbar arrays, and that's, that's being shown here. And, and these work on something, uh, a phase change memory principle, where basically at each of these junctions, you change the resistance uh, and that allows you to store a value. It can act as a synapse. It also does computation. So you can apply a voltage over it and the amount of current there will be the product between, between the voltage and the, um, or the, or your, uh, yeah. yeah, so, so uh, uh, the, the multiplication of the current with the resistance. Uh, and so, but one of the things about designing the, the things this way at, this, at these very small scales and, and low power consumption is that they behave stochastically, okay? So you can't, they, they, they no longer behave deterministically. They're, they're going to sort of make errors. Uh, and, so, and so you have to sort of think about, well, what kind of computing uh, paradigm, what kind of theory of computing could I have that could work under such conditions where I'm at very low power, very small scale. So things are still, I have some kind of systematic signaling going on, but it's just not perfect. Um, how can I still do uh, reliable computation in that, in that setting? And so, uh, so one very promising paradigm that's been developing um, here over the years is something uh, called HD computing. It's basically the idea of computing a computational system uh, or a system for computing with high dimensional vectors. And, and so it's a basically some ideas that were proposed back in the early 90s by people in the connectionist community. And it's been growing uh, you know, over the past maybe 25 years or so, and especially rapidly in the, in the past five years. So many, many groups all over the world working on this. Um, our groups here at Berkeley and the Redwood Center and also with Jan Rabai um, developing and trying to push on these ideas. And some of the main players are here today. So, so Penti Kanerva has been a main proponent of this approach. And uh, Evgeny Osipov, who's visiting and conducts an online seminar, which is, which is basically going every two weeks. So it's a community of people sort of adopting this approach and trying to, trying to develop these ideas. And it's really advanced a lot. And so the basic idea is shown here uh, is that we're gonna take you know, anything that you wanna compute with. It could be symbols, the, you know, letters, words, uh, a variable that you wanna set to a certain value, a number, uh, a color, it could be the value of a function, continuous quantities and so forth, or anything that you wanna compute with. And you take all these quantities and represent them with a high dimensional vector. And it's in the same space, okay? So you pick some dimensionality, typically on the order of a thousand, maybe even as high as 10,000, but you pick some dimensionality and you stay in that space. Okay, so it shares some ideas sort of vaguely with hashing in a way where you assign a, a very high dimensional code to, to assemble, but the difference here is that we have a whole computational system for manipulating these vectors and doing computation with them. In some cases, such as binary, in other cases, uh, we use complex vectors um, shown on the right. That, that's more useful for representing continuous quantities. There's an algebra that operates over these vectors. And uh, so for example, for representing sets, we superimpose the vectors. Uh, you can do key value binding by multiplying the vectors element wise. Uh, and uh, spatial relations and, and sequencing. So this al is a very rich algebra let, that allows us to, to, to manipulate information um, in this framework. And some of the papers are down here below. So I'll make my slides available. I'm gonna have to skip, skip to the end to make, uh, so, so as you can do factorization, um, whoops. Um, and, uh, 
and, and, and other things which I'll have to sort of gloss over here, but I just want to sort of maybe end with one point here about computing with dynamics. This is another a very interesting area that's been advanced um, is, is basically taking these hard combinatorial optimization problems in computer science, like traveling salesmen, the classic things and graph cut and so forth, and trying to solve those with so-called icing machines. So it turns out you can, you can map these problems onto an icing model and the energy function is shown below. And this is the minimization you have to solve. If, and if you can minimize this energy function, then you can basically solve you know, traveling salesmen or you know, these other kinds of problems. And some other work here at Berkeley by, um, by, uh, by Tian Chi Wang and Jajit Rachadhuri has shown how you can minimize these, uh, these, these icing models with uh, using coupled oscillator models. Okay, so basically instead of just representing uh, minus one and plus one, represent them with a complex phaser and allow the phase to spin around and the network and sends a very efficiently does a relaxation to, to find the ground state of this, of this Hamiltonian, of this, I'm sorry, this energy function that can, that can solve these icing models. So this is another super um, exciting development. I just wanted to point you to uh, things happening, I think, uh, in, along, you know, so in, the, in the neuromorphic realm of you know, showing new, new ways that we can compute and solve these combinatorically hard uh, problems that the brain is probably having to solve. At the same time, as we, as we see these uh, examples of how to compute with coupled oscillators, uh, then we sort of look at the brain now with, with, with a new lens. It's sort of very much like the Bright Brothers. You know? It's like if you sort of figured out how to do this twisting idea uh, with the wings, then you look at the birds and you say, oh, that's, that's why they're twisting their wings, right? And so one thing we've known about the brains for a long time is that they oscillate. Uh, well, maybe this is why they oscillate, right? And so, so I think this is, sort of gives us a new way to look back at what these oscillations in the brain, perhaps in a new way, and try to understand what computations. This has long been a mystery. What, what, how do they contribute to oscillation? How do they contribute to, to computation? Okay, so, so basically, I think the the bottom the, the bottom line of what I want to try to convey here is that um, these connections between uh, computer science and neuroscience they're growing, uh, especially rich, I think, in this area of neuromorphic systems that we're going to learn about brains by trying to build these same ideas as a way of testing our understanding, uh, trying to extract these principles from biology. And I think in terms of theory of computing, one thing we really, we, we really need is a theory that can encompass uh, not just complexity, but also time and energy. And, uh, and so maybe, uh, maybe this will be the topic of uh, hopefully uh, maybe another uh, program over the next 10 years uh, sometime. So uh, look for, we may be submitting a proposal soon on that. So um, anyways, thanks very much and happy, happy to take questions at this time. Thanks, Bruno. Questions? Do neurons do just one thing or do they do multiple things in different combinations? Um, definitely the latter. It's, it's a very versatile device. And you, know, you find neurons that perform functions in the retina, they're shaped in ways that this allows them to perform shape functions in the retina that probably don't happen in other parts of the brain. Um, so it's a kind of a, a flexible, flexible uh, building block. One more quick question. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot for the awesome talk. So like some of these ideas, you have some thoughts that how ideas can help this machine learning and artificial intelligence work that is going on that we learn from the brain? Yeah, yeah. I, it's, I, so I guess, uh, you know, I, I, I'm sort of a, maybe pushing a different message here than the standard deep learning uh, analogy. There is a lot of, uh, parallels there as well, um, certainly. Uh, but I think here it's really, you know, I think the question we're trying to understand here is how does the brain solve these difficult optimization problems? Okay, perception is loaded with these problems that are very much like traveling salesmen. They're a form of factorization problems where we have to factorize apart shape from illumination or the position of an object uh, away from its shape or the color and so forth. These are really non-trivial, very difficult problems to solve that the field has struggled with for a long time. And so I guess the, the hope that I see, what I'm very excited about um, is that this progress you know, that's being made with neuromorphic systems, uh, you know, sort of using dynamical systems as a way to solve these problems, using high dimensional vectors, taking things and representing them in a high dimensional space, that allows you to do the things that maybe you weren't able to do before, that, that, seemed, that seemed intractable, and it now gives us sort of a guiding light that, that makes them uh, 
seem more doable, approachable. Yeah. All right. Join me in thanking Bruno for a really fascinating talk.